Hey folks, and welcome back to the Heart of Horsemanship podcast brought to you by Colton Woods Horsemanship. Guys, before we get this episode started this week, I want to take a second to say thank you to each and every one of y'all. Our Facebook, our Instagram accounts have grown tremendously here in the last couple of weeks and the podcast amazingly continues to double in downloads every single month which basically means that you guys are making my wish come true of sharing this with your friends and family if you for whatever reason are one of the people that haven't shared this with your friends and family then be sure to do so because you don't really don't want them to tell you later on why didn't you tell me about the heart of horsemanship sooner but guys i want to say thank you to you guys for your constant support, for leaving that five-star review, for leaving a, a reviewed comment down below in the podcast, and for you guys being that watch on YouTube or see this on Facebook and Instagram, thank you all for engaging. Send us your questions. This episode today is diving into three topics that I have received questions about here in the last two weeks. So it's because we've been working on some things with training horses and sharing those with y'all on our Facebook and Instagram. And then we've got questions in return. And so today is a basic Q&A and a deeper dive into these certain subjects. They're all really, um, I know this episode is called something along the lines of horses that don't like to be brushed, trailer loading, and spooky horses. But the underlying, what it, the subtitle really could be getting to the root of the problem. So we're going to go ahead and dive into the first topic, which was a question sent to me by Julia. And Julia was asking about, and I'll pull my phone up just to make sure I have the exact question. Why do some horses hate to be brushed? Do you think that grooming is important? Well, first and foremost, certainly grooming is important. It's like part of the basic hygiene in with our horses, particularly when we're riding our horses. You can imagine if we don't groom our horses and bathe our horses, that their hair might get to laying funny and matted, and then you go to cinch up against that that hair that's matted, it's almost like if you've gone skiing or if you've wore really high tube socks or something, if your hair is not used to your hair on your legs or any part of your body is not used to that friction of clothing being against it, it can be kind of sore and irritated. And it's just basic hygiene with our horses. We want to make sure, particularly in the springtime, that we're giving our horse an antiseptic type bath to make sure we're combating any fungus or bacteria that's growing just because of the here in Kentucky, we're used to dealing with humidity. Some of you guys may not deal with that at all. But um, grooming is absolutely important. It's something we do with our horses every day. And it's a great thing to do with your horse with no expectation. Um, it's just a thing, something we can do with our horses just to hang out and be with them and make them feel better. Grooming is it's, it's a great time where we're not asking them to really do anything. And we're just saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to make you feel better. We're going to get this mud and stuff off of you. We're gonna make you. We're gonna give you a bath. We're gonna make you feel clean and fresh. And some people might go, "Well, my horse hates that." Well, that's what we're gonna get to in this part of the question. Is is that Julia asked, "Why do some horses hate being brushed?" And my question is, does the horse really hate being brushed, or is there another route to that problem? And a lot of times, what I find with the horses I deal with is that. It could be what we would see is a horse that maybe hates being brushed doesn't always just give us the sign when we go to brush them, but maybe they start to pin their ears or tighten their posture, change their posture when we go to approach that horse. So we haven't even got to the brushing yet, right? We might have grabbed the brush and we're going to go to brush them. But when we go to approach them, they change their entire expression which gets tight and tense, almost looks a little angry, or maybe your horse gets worried. And the question, my question is then, okay, why is that horse giving us that, that they're communicating with us? Because if that, if we were another horse and they give that kind of expression and then we didn't heed that communication, if we didn't listen to that communication, that horse might have to do something else like kick, bite, strike another horse to get their point across. Whereas with a lot of people, the horses know that that, that that is unacceptable. And so, but the problem is that as humans, we don't always listen to those initial ways of communication from our horses and say, hey, I saw that. Hey, I understand something's bothering you. And I have a horse that is, uh, that's been with us and has these kind of types of associations. And he'll do it whether you're going to put like 
before, if you're going to saddle him, if you're going to groom him, if you're just going to walk up to him, he gets really tight. And it's not that he doesn't like being saddled. It's not that he doesn't like being groomed because once you take your time to approach him and acknowledge the fact, say, hey, buddy, I see that you got tight. I see that you're a little bit uncomfortable about whatever is going to happen, whether it's a brush or a saddle pad or just we're walking up to pet him, that if you pause and you just say, hey, I, and, and mentally say, or you can actually say it to your horse if you, if you want to, uh, that, hey, I see that you're a little uncomfortable. Why are you – like? and then start thinking about why is that the case? But a lot of times just simply acknowledging that, that horse is – concern or upset being upset with with initially just the approach to them um can change that horse's perspective because it's the fact that now you're listening to your horse and so why do i think that some horses would essentially hate being brushed is because they have tried to communicate in the past that they were not okay with something and the human maybe not intentionally but they bypassed, they did not even recognize, or maybe they did recognize it and chose not to acknowledge and to deal with the horse's feelings in the situation about not being okay with, his, with what is about to happen. And in turn, when we, when we do that, when we either don't recognize our horse's feelings in those moments, or we don't recognize the communication, the things that they're trying to communicate to us, a couple of things can happen. One can be that they get very upset and very angry, and then they get very crabby, and they get to be just not pleasant to be around, or they always look like they're pissed off, or they can shut down, and they just kind of go inside themselves, and they internalize, and so they probably hold a fair bit of tension within their bodies, but they're very non-expressive quite a bit. And it's basically because they've gone introverted style of dealing with their problems and they just hold it all in. And at some point we come into a principle that I always oftentimes refer to as the pressure cooker where there can only be so much tension inside before something has to be let loose. Right. And in some form or fashion, and that can come out in a variety of ways. But when I look at horses that don't like being brushed, I got to look at, is it actually the brushing? Because it could be. Right. Say that you could walk up to your horse and you can pet them, but you go to brush them and they're very sensitive on their skin. I want to make sure we acknowledge that part at least is that they have some, they're very touchy about their skin. I'm probably going to refer to somebody that's a little more specialized, but personally for me, I'm going to start thinking about my horse's internal system. One of the first go tos that I go to is, is my horse's gut healthy? All right. Is, am I, is my horse feeling good inside? Because we oftentimes, if we, we just think about yourself for a little bit, I know that humans and horses have differences and uniquenesses in our own bodies and how things operate. But if your stomach doesn't feel good, a lot of other things don't work properly or feel optimized in their performance, right? And so... I would be first thinking, hey, is my horse's GI tract taken care of? Is there a good bacteria, a glut flora growing in my horse? And they don't essentially they don't have ulcers or they aren't experiencing uncomfortableness somewhere in their GI tract. And then from there, we might start looking at other types of things as far as uh, kidneys or whatever. There's a, there's I'm really I work very closely with an osteopath um, that is very intuitive and understands the connectedness within the body from certain organs to certain outer type things, whether it's a muscle or maybe just the actual surface level of the skin. And so I would defer to somebody like that, that is more of a professional in that field. So there certainly can be things that we can notice like, Hey, my horse is really, really touchy on the top of their skin and they get really tense. And that, that is legitimate. And that is something that I would then in turn, probably turn to I I tend to turn unless it's an emergency I'll turn to somebody like an osteopath first depending on the issue and then because the osteopath for you guys that don't real may not be familiar an osteopath is a specialist in locomotion of the body and they take into consideration not just the movement of the limbs and the muscles and the tendons but also how the entire body is connected from your central nervous system to the, how the, how their gut system works and how the autonomic nervous system works and how their muscles and their bones and their tendons, like I said, how the whole body moves together and how certain receptors 
in one part of the body can trigger another receptor in the other part of the body. It's the movement of all parts of the body, neurology, the internal organs, as well as our muscles, bone, and tendons type of the deal. So I work very closely with one when I run into any kind of a physical issue. And oftentimes with the one I work with, we talk a lot about gut health. So if you are starting to see like, hey, my horse is just touchy on the top of the skin, you might try to find somebody in your area to talk to and say, hey, like, that is the case. But also make sure like, look at what there's the old principle that says what happens before what happens happens. So we have to recognize what happens before what happens happens. Well, what is happening in this case is the horse is upset about being brushed. Well, what happened before the horse is being upset about being brushed? Well, we, if we could click rewind or we literally could just back up and reapproach, what's the horse like as we're getting closer? And at what point, how close do we get before an expression changes? Some horses right? Say a horse didn't have a trouble with this at all. A horse could get prick their ears and they could be like, Hey, it's great to see you. And they could be, Oh, it could be a very welcoming type of thing. Whereas sometimes you get horses and they're like picking their hind foot up, swishing their tail, cranking their neck, their nose gets tight, their body gets tight. They change their posture and everything just goes the opposite way that we'd like to see them doing it. And we have to recognize that. And sometimes by simply saying, Hey, I see that, which tells your horse, you're aware, you're present with your horses in that moment can then change their entire expression. I do that routinely with the horse that's in our barn that we've been helping with this is that as anytime he gets crabby I, and I, if I'm walking past his stall, if I've got him tied up, if I'm going to go put the bridle on him, if I'm going to put the saddle on him, I just, as soon as he gets tight and everything like that, I just wait. And I wait until his expression changes. And sometimes it takes a bit, a fair bit. But that horse, I can't say this 100%, but I can say it about 98.9% is that he hasn't had someone wait on him in the past. And so he's just gotten very pissed off about people blowing right through everything that he lays out there for you to know that he is upset about it. And people have just put the blinders on and gone right past it. And he's just gotten upset and it got pretty ugly. Um, he pretty much had that pressure cooker effect where everything started coming out and that's why he got sent to us. And that horse, if you just wait on him and he'll flip his ears, he's so expressive and He'll flip his ears and he'll change and he'll take a big deep and sh lick and chew and he'll yawn and he'll, he'll just completely get that dopamine release. But we, when it comes to horses that don't like being brushed, we got to think about, is it actually the brushing? If it is the brushing, is it a physical issue? And then, and then think about the type of brush you're using. Would it be a brush that they would actually like? Are you brushing them in a way that is actually enjoyable? Or are you like, pulling the hair off of their hide right sometimes it's not what we do it's how we do it it's not sometimes it's not the what being that you actually approach your horse but maybe it's how you approach your horse maybe it's how you brush your horse or how you're thinking about your horse they pick up on all of that all right but i'm not that's that's kind of my approach julia to this particular type of question um, and we're going to go ahead and jump in. You guys are going to see this is all going to kind of tie together. And I want to bring you guys a quite a bit of value with jumping through these different ones. So the next one I want to talk about is trailer loading troubles. All right. So some of you guys that follow along, we've got George in. And George, um, we've been sharing a little bit of information about him. We've been filming an entire case study on George. He's an about 18-2, 18-3 hand, Oldenburg gelding. He's a 10-year-old, been in a show kind of a show type program, adult amateur friendly, really, really sweet minded horse um, came to us and confirmationally, he's not really built the best and that's putting it lightly. Um, but he is a very capable horse of doing what his owner needs for him to do. And so, and the reason is important to take into the confirmation is because that's how they move. So we have to recognize when we're asking our horses to do things that we're do, we're asking them to do things that they can actually do. and Basically, George got sent to us because he hadn't been, they couldn't get him on a trailer in the last two, two and a half years. And so we, I committed, I said, okay, we'll take George and 
we'll work with him. So of course I had to get him to our farm. So we backed up uh, our trailer to a round pin and then I loaded him quote unquote at Liberty. He didn't have anything on him. And I just kind of flagged him into the trailer. It took about five, seven minutes. But when we did that, I noticed how, how unconfident George was in his feet. Like it was pretty, it was kind of sad. Like my wife was like, Oh, like, that's really upsetting kind of a thing because what happened was he went to put his front feet in the trailer. The trailer kind of moved a little bit when he went to step into it as they do. And he was like, he kind of squatted down in this downward dog position with his front feet in the trailer and then like backed out and like was like, (laughs) and it was like not quite like a cowering kind of sound, but he was just super unconfident in his feet. And so we're getting to the end of Georgia's training now. And I've had, because we've been putting information out, a lot of you guys have asked about helping your horses with your own trailer loading type situations. And when we talk about the theme of this episode is getting to the root of the problem, we have to ask ourselves, is it actually the trailer that is causing the issue? And most of the time, it's not. Most of the time. I'm not going to say never. But most of the time, it's frankly because there's not enough quality groundwork with our horses to prepare them for what we're going to ask them to do, which would be loading into the trailer. Okay. And so in George's case, he was very unconfident in his feet. He had lacked proprioception in his body and in his feet and proprioception being the self aware, the ability and awareness of knowing where his movement is. And so you have conscious and you have unconscious proprioception, your conscious, your unconscious proprioception is the basic movement and awareness of being able to walk, trot, canter out in the field and pick your feet up going over things that the horses will encounter on a regular basis. Think about horses that are raised, and this isn't necessarily George's case, but like think about some horses that might be raised on a flat paddock and a flat stall, never see mud, never see a hillside, anything like that how good is that horse going to be when you go to try to ask him to walk down a hill they're, they don't have their body doesn't have the experience so they don't have the neurological networks built in their body to be successful versus look at a wild mustang that runs up and down hills through rocks and streams and mud and all these other elements and we talk about how sturdy and how sure-footed those horses are it's because they have the neurological networks built up in their body and they have built that unconscious proprioception to be successful navigating those types of things. So when we look at developing young horses, which I spend a lot of time doing, it is very important that we provide them those types of environments so they can build those types of things because it will affect them in the long term. And if we don't do it early, then we have to incorporate that essentially into their training program or we have to spend time going and spending time doing it for them because it's it's really important because this horse George is going to be a, is a dressage horse and it's really important that he has this proprioception because we have un, then we have conscious proprioception which would be then teaching our horses to be conscious of different maneuvers such as shoulder in haunches in um, a turn on the forehand a turn on the haunches backing up like if they have good un, if they have good unconscious proprioception they have a better chance at advancing when we start to then teach them different maneuvers that they wouldn't necessarily do on their own. And with George's case, he just lacked proprioception. I mean, forget conscious or unconscious. He lacked proprioception in general, which means that he was very unconfident in being able to navigate things such as the trailer because when the tra- when he stepped on it, it moved. And he wasn't very, quote unquote, sure-footed in stepping in that, so it worried him. Okay. So what I noticed with George was it wasn't necessary. There was, he had issues with a trailer, but it wasn't the trailer itself. It was, he just lacked confidence in his own self because he didn't quite in the most basic sense, didn't know where his feet were. Um, and so we've spent a lot of time working, doing all types of groundwork over and over and over and over with some basic foundational groundwork exercises in the round pen and in the arena to help George build better awareness he has to understand the exercises but then he also has to understand how he can distribute his weight so i'll do like a half circle exercise which means i send george out and he's when i send him out he does a turn on the haunches for about 90 degrees and then he walks forward 
And then when I go to change directions, he does another turn on the haunches. And, and so he's having to distribute his weight from the forehand over to his hawks, make that change of direction, and then walk forward again. Be prepared on his own for that next change of direction. We've also done turn on the forehand, which would be yielding the hindquarters over. We've worked on some lateral maneuvers. And then probably the most effective part of this once was pretty much once I have him broken up in the halter is I took him outside and I found, I took him up and down hills. I found creeks and ravines. I found logs that were sitting out and we worked through all over that kind of stuff and building George's proprioception, building his awareness and getting him into a thinking state of mind on how he can step to navigate these different obstacles a lot of time not loading into a horse trailer and what we found was we did load george into a horse trailer freely first because i wanted to get make sure he was there for he's joined us for trailer loading that he was getting comfortable going in and out of the trailer but i didn't have him broken up in the halter for me to for me to feel confident just put him in the trailer so i loaded him from the round pin in and out of the trailer with him loose and then the first time <clears throat> we put him in the trailer with him on the end of the halter no problem at all. But one of the people I wanted to talk to you about was a lady that I've been sending that she's been messaging me privately um, about her horse because she has a really, a really interesting case that I think is going to be very, very important. And she reached out because she saw that we have the George case study and she's like, Hey, I want to, I want to see this because I have trouble loading my horse into a trailer. And one of the things that she said was, it started off with the horse not being competent with those back doors shutting. And my initial thought was like, okay, sure. Maybe there might be a little bit of anxiety, like the trailer doors get shut. But a lot of times, like if I'm going to load my horses into a trailer and shut the doors, I'm throwing their, if I'm actually going to take them somewhere, I'm going to toss their hay net in there. We're going to close it up and we're going to get on the road and go. But this a lot of times I find that people tend to turn trailer loading into a training session. And I think trailer loading is one of those things that we need to make sure our horses do it. But we don't want to just harp on trailer loading. We don't want to harp on anything because we want to be able to train our horse in a versatile type of way that they're gaining the skills and the experiences in a variety of ways. That way they're set up for success, just like George. Like I took him down creeks and hills and ravines and over logs and stuff in the name of trailer loading, knowing that it was going to help him with his trailer loading, but I didn't practice trailer loading. And so a lot of times people want to make sure their horse is good at trailer loading, so they do trailer loading, and then they create an issue where there may not have ever been an issue in the first place. And so this case, she was like, at first our conversation was like, hey, he's really unsure about these doors shutting. And I was like, hey, that's, that's legitimate. I understand. You know, but she, I said, go back and watch the video that I put up of George and talk about how I'm working with the horse on the ground beforehand. And that was, and one comment she made in that initial message says, well, I could take him on a trip for his own. Uh, I want to take him on a sh short trip just to let him get experience. And I told her, I was like, I'm actually a pretty big fan of hauling my horses longer distance on those so they have time to settle in because a lot of the principles that um i picked up from one of my good friends and that when you start along on horses you'll see is that sometimes relaxation is the name of the game and sometimes when we're working with our horses trying to get them relaxed we can start with that and then say we ask them to trot ask a green colt to trot they might get a little tight so what are we going to do well, if, it, if they're getting ready to buck, we're going to slow them down, bring them back, say, hey, 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 that's not quite the mindset we want. That's not, we want you to relax. We want you to breathe. And then we'll try again. But if a horse is kind of going around, but they're, they're a little choppy, they're a little unbalanced because they're a little tight, but yet they're going on, we might go until they start to breathe. You guys might be riding your horses and you say, I ask them to trot. And then you start to hear them exhale and they blow through their nose a lot. That's those horses moving until they start to relax. And so I use that same principle when I go to trailer load my horses a lot of times is that I want to take, when I go to take them on a trip, um, I like to take them, some, like go somewhere for a couple hours. That way, if we go to start to move and we go down the road and they get a little bit nervous, they have time to settle in and they get their trailer legs, let's call it, right? Um, 
and they, they can settle in and they can get comfortable in that trailer. And so a lot of times when people are having trailer loading issues, I tell people like, once you, once you get them good going in and out of a trailer and you're going to take them somewhere, go somewhere. Don't just take them 15 minutes around the block to go get some ice cream and then come back. Why? Because oftentimes you don't go far enough and they get just worried enough in the trailer and then you take them off because the ride's over and they haven't had time to settle in. Well, so here's what ended up happening with this situation. And she worked with him for a couple of days on the trailer loading. And then she decided to take him on like an hour, hour and a half long trip. And she got him home. And unfortunately he was lathered, soaking wet and very, very anxious about the whole thing. All right. Which is, I feel really bad for the horse. I felt bad for her. She felt bad for him. She was like, what do I do wrong? Can you help me? And of course, because all this is over Facebook Messenger and I'm just answering questions as I can to help her out. And so I'm going to try to find the part in the message that really stuck out to me because when I read it, it gave me direct insight to what was going on. And this is something that's really, really important to realize is that she said in here, let me find it so I make sure I get the right words. Ah, here it is. He loads perfectly in the trailer, but gets highly anxious being in the trailer alone and with the rear door shut or the rear doors closed. And so when I read that, that was just a, a part of a bigger message. And it said, he loads perfectly, but gets highly anxious being in the trailer alone with the rear doors closed. And initially the issue was the rear doors. But when I reread that, and that was something that her and I talked about, but when her, when I reread that and I was like, Hey, um, let's think about this for a second. And I, I sent her back a question. I said, how does he do when he's alone without the trailer being involved, whether that's in a stall when no one else is in the barn or perhaps tied up by himself when other horses are elsewhere, how does he do then? And she came back and said, great question. I've never really had him alone because I have, I board and there's about 40 horses in various pastures pretty much all the time. You're thinking separation anxiety triggered by isolation in the trailer that fits. So getting to the root of the problem, this horse trailer was trailer loading just fine. Mm -hmm they started to notice he would get anxious about the time that the rear doors closed. But it probably didn't have anything to do with the rear doors closing, okay? It, she said the answer to the problem in her own question, which basically said this horse had a separation anxiety because they're herd animals. So it's very understandable but that they would have this, this struggle, right? But we have to understand, if we're going to trailer load our horses and they're going to haul alone, uh, we have to know that they can be comfortable being by themselves, which means like for, my, for what we do at our place, we will tie our horses up before and after we ride them. So we'll tie them up so we can groom them off and they'll stand there. And sometimes there's a buddy down, tied out down in the barn aisle down the way, or sometimes they're there by themselves. And then after we work them, we let them hang out. If they're sweaty, they dry off, or if we hosed them or whatever. But all of our horses spend time being tied up. And one, because they got to tie in the trailer. And two, they'll all at some point experience being alone. And it, particularly if I have a horse that I know is super anxious and is very impatient and can't, isn't comfortable spending time by themselves and being alone, then I'm going to make sure that we address that because one, you don't need them digging a hole to China if they're tied up. And two, for a trailer loading type situation like this, this horse had a, had a rough experience in the trailer, but it wasn't necessarily based on the way I'm, I've perceived it at this point, based on the information I have, what had nothing to do with the fact that he was anxious about the trailer is that the fact that he was tore up because he didn't have any friends or buddies in there with him. And I would, I, I think about this, I'm like, okay, well, you look at these horses that, some of the wild Mustangs, they round them up out west and they put them in trailers and they haul them across the country. I've been there when they've arrived. They're fine. But they have 20 or 30 of them in the trailer. 
and they're all together. So they have companionship in there. They have comfort in a herd. Whereas now we've taken a herd animal, put them in a box by themselves and said, you're good. Sometimes they're not good if we haven't given them those experiences ahead of time. So in their, in your trailer loading situations, what's the root of the problem? If you're having trouble with the trailer loading, is it your groundwork? Is it them being understanding and confident in their feet? Are they prepared to then be able to be by themselves? Can you tie them up for a while by themselves? You know, we have to, I always, with anything, I strip down all of the pieces of the puzzle, whether I'm going to go show a horse or whether I'm dealing with a problem, problem that has been created or has arisen. Um, I want to break down all these pieces and I want to get down to the base layer and that foundation. And I want to, I want to look at it from the horse's perspective. And I want to say, what is this horse? What is this horse really thinking? How do they really feel about what's going on? How is it being presented? What is being presented to the horse? And break down all of these pieces because we need a strong product. We need a strong foundation. We need a strong understanding, great confidence, and ultimately a partnership with our horses at the end of the day. And in order to do that, we have to make sure that we're looking at this not just from our perspective, right? And we have to strip the emotions out of it, and we got to be factual about this. and. There's feelings involved, but most of the feelings that I think need to be taken into consideration are the feelings of your horse and then recognize those and say, how do we need to deal with those? You know, are they great, good feelings? Are they not so good feelings? Do they result in wanted behaviors or unwanted behaviors, right? But you guys, that's how I, how I strip down the trailer loading. That is a very real example um, that, you know, a couple of examples that we've dealt with with trailer loading. And that's how I'm going to get to the root of the issue on those. Now, the last thing for today's episode is spooky horses. So I got reached, I've been reached out to here the last couple of weeks to help people write some articles. Um, and a lot of it has to do with either desensitizing or obstacles or spooky horses. And so all of this is really, really important information that I want to really strip down for you guys. Because when we go to deal with spooky horses, we need to understand a couple of things, okay? Um, one of the things that we need to understand with our horses when it comes to spooking is, well, let me start with this. Let me start with this. When our horses spook at something, why would, ask yourself, why does my horse spook at that? We've all been told a lot of reasons. We've all said a lot of reasons for why they spooky things. Some people might call him a damn idiot. Be like, oh, he's just stupid. Like he's a coward. He's a chicken, right? We've all probably heard that kind of stuff. Oh, he's seen it a thousand times. Okay. <laughs> There's some legitimacy to like a horse having seen stuff and then spooks at it. It's like, okay, we'll talk about that in a second. But um, what causes a horse to spook? We have to understand that. As horse owners, we need to understand how our horses think and how they and how they process things, how they think and how they communicate. Because when we're working with our horses, we're communicating with with them. But it's a two way street in order for it to really be effective and really to be positive with our horses. A lot of us are on a one way highway, and it's my way or the highway, and you can get off at any exit you want. Is how some of us treat our horses. The problem is the exit. All they do is they get off the exit and they get back on the highway the next day and you're back there dealing with them. Like it's not like you actually get rid of them, right? So you have a rough session, horse doesn't get much out of it, everyone's pissed off and tired, and the horse just goes to the field and he's just like, What the hell did you learn today? And he's like, I don't know what the hell is going on. The human was in another realm. I don't know what was what the deal was, right? So with our spooky horse, we have to understand how they think. When our horses spook, they have a genuine concern for something that could be life-threatening, okay? And when they make, uh, they re respond with a reaction by what we would, that reaction being the spook, they are doing what their natural, instinctual self is telling them, you need to do whatever you need to do to get away from that the plastic bag included because it might get you and it might hurt you and it might hurt you in a way that may kill you. And so when we are with our horses, we have to understand 
that that self-preservation instinct is crucial to their survival. And so I wanted you to put yourself in the horse's position and say that maybe you were with a, hopefully you're with a friend, but say you're with someone who you're following or you're supposed to be following, right? You're the horse and this person is saying, hey, we're going to go over here. And you're like, I don't know about that. You're like, no, 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 we're going to go over here. And you're like, I, I don't think so. And you start to slow down and you start to look around. And you're like, I, I, I don't know about that. And um, the person's like, no, like, seriously, we're going over here. And they start to push you over there or, you know, they get behind you and they have a whip and they're like, hey, go, like, get over there. Like, no, like, we're going. What are you going to do? How would you feel in that moment when you you growing concern about something you can see in the future that's getting closer and someone's like, no, 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 you need to get over there right now. Like, now that go. Like, I'm not asking you anymore. I'm telling you, you need to go. What are you going to do? Are you going to fight by everything escalating and you trying to get away faster? Or are you a person that's going to shut down and be like, just go internalize and still feel tense and tight and unsure, but because you don't want to cause conflict, go through with it anyway and then know that at a later date there's only you're gonna have a breakdown because there's only so much you can take of being treated that way right or you have another situation where everything's great and then someone jumps out from behind a corner you know which means like the cat jumps out of the flower box and then you dart sideways you're like oh my god you scared me right and then the person that you're with grabs a hold of you and says get your act together Quit acting that way. And in the moment that you're the most scared, you have all this extra confining pressure that comes in and you go, oh my God, I was scared of that. And then now I can't go anywhere. So then what do I, I have to save myself. What am I going to do? Are you just going to internalize it or are you going to react even harder and all the tenseness now escalates 10 times and it gets worse, right? You got to put yourself in the horse's situation and realize that we've all been scared. We've all been scared of something that's coming up in the near future, and we've all been scared of things that just pop up out of nowhere, right? Um, the cat necessarily wasn't out of nowhere. The cat was there the whole time, but you didn't notice it. So, boom, reaction, right? Um, we got to put ourselves in the horse's situation. And we have to, the one thing that's different is that we have to realize these horses are prey animals. They have to survive. They are fight, flight, or freeze instincts. So, when a horse spooks, that means that they have a con genuine concern for something to such the degree that they then go into what we would call the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight, fight, or freeze response, fight, flight, or freeze responses. And when they go there, they are in survival mode and they're just trying to live. All right. And from a person's perspective, we have to understand our horses will do things that are dangerous. In those moments, they do not do them to be bad. They do them to survive. And so what do we, how do we handle those situations? Well, we want to make sure that we look at what happens before what happens happens. So all best case scenario is we can see these coming and respond accordingly to help our horses before something turns into a big fiasco. But let's say we end up in the fiasco. Right, particularly those situations will happen if um, a horse su suddenly, very promptly gets gets scared. You know, somebody does something that is out of our control, and the horse spooks. We have to stay safe, right? So whether you're on the ground or under saddle, you have to stay safe. But it's how we go about it. So you can still stop your horse, but how you stop your horse can ultimately change the way that that experience goes do you rip on the reins as hard as you can because you're upset that it happened or do you pick up as quickly as you have to but as smooth as you can and in a mindset that says i'm doing this to help us help you to help myself so we don't get hurt because at that point you have to realize your horse is like at the, the their greatest concern is whatever just worried them and hopefully it wasn't you and when you go to pick up on them to say, hey, I'm here to help you, and we got to slow down here, that you're doing it in a way that is to help them, 
okay? It's whatever you're doing is there to help them. And that is why when I train my horses on the ground and under saddle in the most foundation principles that we would instill into them beyond relaxation is that the aids are not there to control the horse, right? I don't ask them to go left or go right, to follow a right rein, to follow a left rein, to move off a leg, to yield their hindquarters, to back up. I don't ask them to do those things in the name of just getting control. Certainly it gives us control, but when I place a leg on the side of my horse, when I tap with a crop, when I pick up with the reins, it is to help that horse find softness in their body which is relaxation in the mind. They have to be relaxed in the mind in order to be relaxed and supple in the body. And unless they've internalized it, then they can hold mental tension, but that's another conversation. But the main principle is when I go to make an adjustment with my reins, my legs, whether on the ground or under saddle, it is there to help that horse find the answer to what I'm looking for and be in a relaxed manner. So a lot of times when a horse has a panic attack and some, and some people pick up on their horse, that added picking up of the reins adds more pressure to the situation because the horse associates that with the horse, with them trying to box that horse in. Whereas what I have found after starting a lot of colts and working with a lot of troubled horses and helping me with their horses is once I've had enough time to work with these horses and they, I start to understand that when they start to feel me pick up on the rein or place a leg, it is there to help them. And that is a mental thought process. That is an association to the aids. And when they have that mindset, in a moment of panic, when I go to shorten up on the reins or place a leg, they feel that my mindset has helped translate to them that I am there to guide them, to be their leader in that moment, to help them stay out of trouble and it is not, I'm not there to stop them necessarily from darting away. I'm there to say, hey, you can stay right here. I promise this won't get you. I am here to prove that to you. Just bear with me for a second. Stay between my legs. Stay between my hands. And in this moment, I will make sure that I put you in a position to succeed and that you can find out this is going to be okay. And that is a lot of mental. That is a lot of mental on our part because it, it's the mental on our part and how we use our aids when we're working with our horses. And that is so, 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 so important that we build that into our horses that when we go to pick up on a rein, is to help them relax, help them supple, help them better understand. Because in these moments when they have spooky, this troubles, we want to be there to help them. And one of the things that we were talking, I was initiating a little bit earlier is what happened before what happened happened. So we need to be in a constant communication with our horses. When we see growing concern with our horses, we don't jam them up in a situation that they're not prepared for. We need to spend the time to give them the proper tools, the proper foundational tools to be successful on the ground and under saddle away from spooky objects. And then realize that if we start to feel our horse's concern grow, that we acknowledge that and we work with them on that and we don't feed into it to make a problem bigger. Now, I want to talk about the idea of spooky objects in general. All right. This is something that I think hopefully everyone still listens to this point because this is, if you take anything home out of this section of the podcast, it should be this. How many of y'all have taken your horse somewhere or brought something into an arena to, to give your horse experience, with, whether it's a tarp, a bridge, a jump with a flower box, a liver pool, or you go to a new place and there's hedges or there's golf carts or whatever the hell's out there, right? But there is something in that arena. You're like, my horse might be scared of that. And what do you do? A lot of people. They go and they show their horse those things to show them that it's going to be okay. All right? That sounds okay. I'm going to go show my horse this so that they're going to be okay with it. How many of y'all have done that and then your horse spooked at the exact same thing that you showed them? And you're like, gosh, dang it. I, I showed this to you. Like, what the hell is your problem? And I've seen it happen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times at a clinics all across the country and help people with this all over the place. You're not alone. It's understandable. But the problem with that is that you sh- why did you show your horse that thing? Well, 
one of the reasons you showed them is because you want them to be okay with it. But the real reason that you ultimately did it was because you thought initially that your horse might be scared of that thing. And that is the manifestation of the problem that we don't want to have happen. All right. So what is the answer to this? To me, if you have the foundational principles that you need, if you have the, if your horse associates the age with helping them, to help them stay relaxed, and you have basic body control, and they're in a good state of mind, I don't ever show them anything. The idea of using obstacles sometimes is to desensitize our horses. And I'll get into that in a second, trust me. But like showing our horses something, we have to think about why we're doing it. We did it because we thought our horse might be concerned about it. Well, what ends up happening is that that thought process goes from our brains to their brains. And we, uh, the horse walks up to it and we're like, okay, this is interesting. Um, and then you stay there and you're like, are you really okay with it? And your horse is like, is there something wrong with this? Is there something I should know about this? Like, is this going to get me? And you're like, it's okay. Like, it won't get you. And you're like, but why? Like, why are you showing me this? Like, is this is this going to be a problem? And for too long, you have convinced your horse of something that they would never have had a problem with. That you had some concern within your body that your horse might be concerned about. So your horse is like, well, if you're concerned about this, I should be concerned about this. And I'm a prey animal, so then I shouldn't get anywhere near this because this could get me right and it could have all been avoided in the first place if and this is how i approach things whether i'm going to show my horse a new obstacle or anything new or if i'm going to take my horse to a new environment and things are going to be different you know what i do i focus on the things that they know all right i go through the exact particularly in a new environment i'm not going to be necessarily teaching them a whole bunch of new stuff but i am going to be working with them and building their confidence and saying hey we're in a new place or hey yeah there's some stuff spread around the arena or outside in the trail that you haven't seen before, but we're just going to focus on all the things you know. Don't worry about those other things. And like I said, there's no concern. There, you give them, you like, why would your horse be concerned about that? You don't know. Your horse didn't say, hey, I'm scared of that. They might in a second. But initially, a lot of times these horses have no concern for those things that we have concern about. And then, but we, we build that concern into our horses versus saying, look at your horse for where they're at. Are they concerned about it? Nope. Then don't worry about it. Go and do the things that they already know how to do. And then if you go to approach that obstacle because you're like, hey, let's walk over the bridge or hey, like, let's just ride around this. You're not riding. If you're riding around it because you're trying to get them okay with it, you might be manifesting a problem. But if you're just riding around it because it happens to be in that location, you're not manifesting a trouble, any trouble. Now, let's say your horse does get concerned about it, though. And you have made sure that you have mentally not manifested this problem. It's okay. It's completely okay because they haven't seen it before. So it's one of those things that I'm not going to give my horse any reason to be concerned about the spooky object because it's not a spooky object. It's an object, right? Let's go ahead and just cross the word spooky out of the entire situation. It's an object. It's an, it's something that we're going to use to give our horses a new experience. And if they've never seen it before, we understand wholeheartedly that our horse has the full damn right to be concerned about it because they've never seen it before. They've never experienced it before. But you have instilled the principles and the, and the education they need to be successful. If you haven't done that, don't put your horse in that situation. But if you have, then you can confidently say, hey, buddy, I understand that you're concerned about this, but we got this. We've got, you just need to like, stay with me. Cause I'm going to stay, I'm going to stay relaxed. I'm confident you can do this. I know you have the understanding and the knowledge to be successful and we got this. And then you let, then you mentally connect with your horse and say, I understand your concern. You have the right to be concerned because this is totally new, but I will show you, you have no reason to be concerned about this. Doesn't mean they cannot be concerned. It means that you understand why they are concerned. And then you leave them at that, right? Versus saying, hey, this could be scary. If we go back to the conversation we just had, right? And so I don't descend, I don't think about objects, about spooky objects. I focus on my horse's education and the tools they will need to be successful when, a, when getting into new situations that they may not. Because we can't, we can't expose our horses to everything, but we can give them the tools 
the actual physical body control tools and the mental mindset and thought processes that they need to be successful in those moments to take on almost any situation that they encounter in their entire lives. The rest of that depends on how we as people handle that situation. All right. And so we have to understand how our horses think. We have to have a two way communication. We have to understand how to read our horses' communication on the ground and under saddle, be able to read their ears, read how they're how they holding their nose. Are there is their nose a little offset? Is it is it tight? Is it all is it tilted? Are they holding tension in their body? Can you see their skin wrinkled up or their muscles are tight? You know, are they swishing their tail? Are they are they standing there with a cocked foot? Are they have a droopy lip? How are they blinking? Are they have short, fast blinkings? Are they not blinking at all? Are they taking big, deep blinks, right? We have to be able to take in all of these things with our horses to help them navigate these situations. It's communication. They don't speak English back to us verbally, right? We have to listen to their body. We have to listen to the the way they hold themselves, the way they maneuver. We have to when what is your when you're working with your horse, you gotta think, what is my horse thinking about? What are they thinking about? Sometimes is that are they even mentally present with me? Are they concerned? Are they super focused? Are they nice and relaxed? What is your horse thinking about? That's when I ride my horses, it's not so much about where their feet are all the time. It's about where their mind is at. And when we put in objects that cause concern, we find out really fast where their mind's at. And then it, then it changes the way their feet go. So when you're working with your horse, in situations that might cause concern, you got to know where your horse's mind is at. And that's a lot of times when I start to feel, when I'm riding my horses, and I use that four-letter word feel, when you feel that your horse's mind is going elsewhere, you redirect the mind. The feet will follow. Then there's other times when you get into the whole Ray or Tom saying that says, sometimes you got to work the mind to get to the feet, and other times you got to work the feet to get to the mind. And that is a situational type of deal. But I want to talk about one last thing. It's desensitizing our horses, okay? Because I think this and the spooky object thing end up getting tied in very closely. And I've worked with a lot of horses that have either had no experience with obstacles or any type of desensitizing. And then I've worked with a lot of horses that have a lot of experience with desensitizing. And I will lay this flat out there. When I got started, I was introduced to a style of horsemanship where the desensitization, at least on the surface level and on green and on green humans understanding of it was that we need to desensitize our horses, which was give them experiences to all these things. Today, some odd years later, I do not desensitize my horses. Okay. I do not believe in desensitizing horses. Why? Because one, they're naturally sensitive creatures, but two, to desensitize oftentimes means to make them realize those things mean nothing, okay? And we have to understand what that means. That means that if we desensitize our horses to such a degree, they become non-responsive to whatever it is. But it's not oftentimes that simple. It's not like you can desensitize your horse to a tarp and then they are forever just only desensitized to the tarp, right? Oftentimes, this bleeds over into other areas of working with our horses. And so this really is a mindset thing, like a lot of things that we've talked about today. And when I think about desensitizing my horses, I don't think about desensitizing. I think about building my horse's confidence. I think about giving my horses different types of experiences with different things that will build their confidence and their understanding in the things that they already know. Okay. So if I'm going to introduce a tar to my horse, I'm going to, I'm not the only new thing I'm introducing is the tarp itself, but everything else I'm asking my horse to do is what they already know. So it might be groundwork, right? So I might be sending my horse past the tarp on the ground. Well, the new, uh, the new, the new thing that they're being exposed to is the tarp. But all I'm doing is my groundwork. Okay. They may, or, and we go back to the whole spooky thing. They may or may not be concerned about it. I'm not going to give them any concern to be about it, but I'm going to understand if they are concerned about it. And 
I'm not there to desensitize my horse to the tarp. I'm there to give my horse experience with the tarp, with the jump, with the bridge, with the creek, with the liver pool, with whatever type of object, right? But I am not desensitizing my horses because this is what happens. And I've had numerous horses sent to me that have had way, way too much desensitizing work. They become dull. They become lethargic. They lack a lot of forward, okay? And then it takes more to build that sensitivity back into them because we got to get them to move their feet, right? And what ends up happening is a lot of times we desensitize horses. We do it when they're standing still. And so we can throw pool noodles on them and we can throw tarps on them. We can saddle them. We can throw ropes around them. We can do flags and balloons and teddy bears and all sorts of stuff, right? And it all looks great. And sometimes we'll do it at the walk. But very, 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 very few people do it at the trot and the canter with their horses, which would require to, to maintain full movement. A lot of times these things happen when the horse is just hanging out at all, stand still, and sometimes a walk. And these horses lack forward. They lack sensitivity. They lack impulsion. All of, They lack all the basic things we need to do to get them started on the ground and under saddle which is you know the rhythm the impulsion the relaxate like, they might be relaxed but they don't have any impulsion in behind and they don't they're not super responsive because they've been so doled up to all these other things so they've been told nothing means anything and you don't have to do anything and then we step in and we say now we're gonna do groundwork and you have to move your feet and oh by the way when you feel something on your side which is called my leg or when i bump you on the ground with the side of the stirrup you need to move away from that but they've had so many experiences with things flapping around on them that they're like, well, I don't have to do anything. Like that doesn't mean anything. And it's so important that we have a proper approach to giving our horses experience. I'm not opposed to giving your horse all the experiences with all those little objects that I just mentioned, but we have to make sure that our horses maintain the sensitivity to what is important. And when we go to desensitize our horses, we just dull their entire world up a lot of times. And then what ends up happening is those horses get so dull and lethargic that when we do need to really get them forward, you start dealing with horses that suck back, horses that get tight in the back, horses that might buck, rear, kick out, um, all of these things. Or you actually, like I had a horse in, and this horse taught me a lot. He was so stimulated. He was so used to being messed with you know, in, in a desensitizing format that he couldn't focus because he was always into everything. Cause they were always like bringing stuff out for him to mess with. And like, they were messing with him and he was always into stuff. And then when I got him to start him, I couldn't keep him focused long enough to get a saddle on him because he was like rummaging around and all of these types of things. And so the horse had trouble being mentally present in that moment. And that, that horse had a lot, we had a lot of mental stuff to go through. He was a very, 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 very FEI level horse, but he, the, the over desensitizing, the overstimulation of human interaction at such a young age impeded him when it came time to then be started to have more of a curriculum because he was going into a dressage program. And so, um, you know, guys, we have to always keep in mind the found the basic principles. And even importantly, yeah, it's important as a person that starts a lot of colts. I also am fortunate to have ridden and continue to ride more advanced horses. And that gives me a vision of where my colts need to go in many different disciplines. And so that's important with your own horse to know where you're going because it gives you an idea of like, oh, that's a piece that I need to make sure that I keep in my colt or like your, your, your young horse, or your green horse might offer something or even more advanced horse offers you something you're like hey that's a good part of the puzzle because i need that later for this or oh no like that's going to get in the way so we got to work on that but when you're working with your spooky horse or the spooky objects or the things that might spook your horse you guys just break it down make sure they have the foundational pieces and focus on how you're presenting things to your horses listen to where your horse's mind is at and adjust accordingly we don't want to push them past that threshold into that sympathetic nervous system whereas the fight fight or freeze thing because they're not going to learn in that state of mind they are in straight survival mode and so when they get to that moment we got to work with them and help them come back from that 
And ultimately, we want to make sure that we're not necessarily desensitizing our horses, but we're offering our horses experiences that they can grow more confident and more understanding in what they already know. They can get new life experiences. So if they encounter them down the road, they say, hey, there's no worries to be there. I know how to handle that. And if they have a similar experience, but not the same experience, it's the same philosophy, the same mindset on how they're going to handle that down the road. And so a lot of this falls back onto us on how we handle these situations. We have to understand how our horses think. We have to be able to strip things down and really get to the root of the issue, whether it's just interacting with the horse in the barn when you're going to brush them, whether it's trailer loading, whether it's spooky things that come up in life, Halloween, right? Guys, so that's what I wanted to walk you guys through this episode, guys, on the Heart of Horsemanship show and our podcast. Um, I really appreciate all of y'all tuning in. I hope that you guys found some insight and helpful um, tips out of this. Be sure to let us know if you did. If you have questions or recommendations that you guys would like for us to feature on the show, you can send us an email at office.coltonwoodshorsemanship at gmail.com. Uh, if you're watching this on Facebook, YouTube, or you found it on clips on Instagram, you can always put those down in the comments below. The Heart of Horsemanship guys on podcasts, I, iTunes, Android, Spotify, you guys can always send us that email. But we always ask you guys, hey, click that like button, click that subscribe button, leave us a review, five-star review and a comment down below. Let us know. Share with your friends and family. I really enjoy bringing you guys as much value as I can. We have an awesome, awesome project that I want to go ahead and share with y'all right now before you guys drop away from us because it launches in less than like two weeks and it's called the Inner Circle. All right, guys, it's going to be the Inner Circle with Colt Woods Horsemanship. It's going to be an exclusive educational opportunity for people to take their horsemanship and their lifemanship to the next level. Why? Because we think we believe that horsemanship is not just a way to train our horses, but it's everything we do with our horses and in our own lives. I think that theme rang really true in this episode when we talk about the human factor, the human element in working with our horses and how much we have to make sure that we're working on us as well as working on our horses, whether it's presence, self-awareness, knowledge and understanding on how our horses think, how they communicate, how we can influence what we're doing to be better communicators and partners for our horses, how to build that connection with our horses and how to build our own skills and abilities, as well as the skills and abilities of our horses. Whether you want to go into the dressage ring, the ranch horse events, Western dressage, classical dressage, whatever you want to do, guys, we are putting together a resource for you guys called the inner circle that is going to be available here. Like I said, in less than two weeks and we're going to have full-length case study. That's where George's case study that a lot of you guys have asked about is going to be available. And we have many more from Colt starting series, the Hackmore series to – guys, we've broken this down from how-to videos on step-by-step -step exercises that we do to the principles and the philosophies, which really breaks down how we go about doing them, how we think about them, and then the real-life case studies of working with horses in training, horses at clinics, and people that come in for lessons. And we're showing you – all of that stuff coming together in a real life scenario, working towards goals of owners and our goals with our performance horses or just horses that are going to be out me trail horses or whatever it is that we're taking all those how to's and all those principles and philosophies that you can learn about individually, which we need to do because we need to add those to our toolbox. And then you see them in a real life situation with a horse that is, we're working with them in the moment that doesn't art, that doesn't have an idea of all the principles that we're working on and all the skills we're teaching those horses those mindsets those philosophies that the horse needs to have as well as the owner and teaching them the physical skills to how to be successful in the world so we're putting this all together and it's gonna i'm super super excited we've been working my wife and i've been working super hard on this and i'm really excited to open this up um, a new level of horsemanship and lifemanship opportunity for you guys we're going to be all sorts of perks um, that we're going to share with, but I'm going to go ahead and drop that right now. You guys can, if you guys want to make sure you stay in the loop, you guys can send us an email and say, let me know. Um, just put inner circle with Colton Woods Horsemanship in the subject and say, keep me updated. We will add you to our email list and we don't spam you guys. I promise you, we don't spam you guys. All we do is we send you stuff that is important, whether it's an educational video, a link to the podcast, it is stuff to add value to your lives and your horsemanship. And when we do launch this within the next two weeks, we will be sharing that link with you so that you guys can have direct access. There's going to be a big special for those first hundred people that sign up. 
So guys, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for listening to the Heart of Horsemanship show and podcast. Super blessed to have all of y'all here with us. Like I said at the start of the episode, absolutely humbled by how much everything is growing right now with the podcast downloads and our Facebook community, which is Coldwoods Horsemanship Community on Facebook. You guys can join that group absolutely for free. And we have over, gosh, it's getting close to 600 people right now. And you can watch it on Facebook and on Instagram. We're on TikTok. Yes, you can find us on TikTok. I am working on those TikToks. And uh, guys, thanks again. We hope you guys have an absolutely blessed day the rest of your week with your horses. Let us know how we can help you with your horses. You guys keep on after it. Wishing you and your family nothing but health and happiness. Y'all keep on keeping on. We'll check for you next time.